Thank you, Father, for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings each and every day. And Father, teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts to wisdom. And we know, Lord, that you have allotted the days of our life and those days are to be used for your honor and glory. So we pray that we might take in the word this evening, that we might uh, manifest your character as we live out the Christian way of life. And we pray, Father, that the believers might take in the word of God with humility and receive with meekness and grant the word of God, which is able to save our soul from sin's power. Sanctify the believers here through your truth, because your word is truth. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew 24, 21. Matthew 24, 21. And uh, last time we were together, we spoke of this unparalleled time of world trouble called the Great Tribulation. Uh, there are various terms we looked at in the Old and New Testament for this period of time. Uh, most common term other than the tri word tribulation is the day of the Lord. And so you'll see that phrase in the Old and New Testament used of this coming period of, of unparalleled trouble. Tribulation period in general, seven years in length. But this part of the portion of the tribulation is called the Great Tribulation. And this is the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th seven. So this period of time, that last three and a half years in which Antichrist will be world leader, in which Antichrist will persecute the Jews uh, during this period of time. Again, it's the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. It will be unparalleled in world history. It says, then will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no more shall ever be. And certainly, uh, as we kind of uh, critique Praetorism uh, in a few lessons ago. Uh, this um, is not AD 70 judgment. That was not unparalleled for the Jews. World War II, the six million Jews killed was far worse for them. Um, and this period of time will be even worse than that. And therefore, to try to make this some event that was already fulfilled in the past doesn't fit. Uh, this is still a future event of unparalleled trouble. So this is called the Megos, intense tribulation. The Megos meaning great or intense. Flipsis is a Greek word for tribulation. And this is distress that is brought about by outward circumstances. Trouble that inflicts distress, oppression, or affliction. Now, verse 22 says, except those days should be cut off, there will be no flesh be saved. Now, we have to keep in mind the word saved here does not mean saved from sin's penalty, does not mean saved from sin's power, does not mean saved from sin's presence. This means physical salvation or deliverance. Sort of along the similar lines when Peter was sinking in the water and he said, Lord, save me. That aspect of deliver me physically. So the idea of this day, th this period of time, unless God cut it off, the word shortened doesn't mean to be taking, it doesn't mean to take it from seven years to, you know, two and a half years or from three and a half years to, you know, um, a few months or whatever. Uh, it's unfortunate that the pre-wrath rapture people, well, I call them the three-quarter rapture, three-quarter tribulation people, they believe you go through three quarters of the tribulation, then you're raptured. A view that was popular uh, a few years ago by Marvin Rosenthal, um, they try to twist that verse to mean that in the tribulation that the Bible says is three and a half years, 42 days, one, 42 months, 1,260 days, time, time, and a half times. That's really not, that's really shortened to whatever figure they came up with. I was like, that's not the word for shorten. Word shorten means cut off. And the idea of this was cut off in eternity past. God predetermined that this period of time would only run three and a half years, this latter half of Daniel 70 at 7. And unless at that, that period of time would it be, would, would, in God's, God's permission, if that period of time was allowed to run to, say, four, five, six, seven years, uh, no person would be left alive on planet Earth. Imagine that. That's how bad that period of time will be. But for the elect's sake, and we're going to focus on that phrase this evening, for the elect's sake, those days will be cut off. God's not going to allow 
the human population to be annihilated, he's certainly going to not allow the Jews, who are the elect. I'll just, just tell you straight up front, the elect are the elect nation of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jews. And God is going to cut and terminate that period of time at three and a half years because of God's future plan with Israel. He's not going to allow Israel to be annihilated before he fulfills his covenant promises. So the word shorten we, we examine is the aorist tense verb, and it means to cut off, unless those days were literally cut off, and they were in eternity past, no flesh will be physically alive on planet Earth. But uh, we, we looked at the unparalleled nature last week of that period of time. We have the, just for instance, Revelation 6, 8, the fourth seal, one-fourth of the Earth's population is killed. Uh, Revelation 9, 18, six, the trumpet, sixth trumpet judgment, one-third of the Earth's population killed. Now, I was doing math and I thought adding those two figures together would be over half, but when you think of it, though, actually when you take the Earth's population down by one-fourth and then do one-third of that number, <laughs> which is really what you should do, it's about half. 50% of Earth's population will be wiped out just with two judgments. So really, 50 or half of the world's population will be uh, removed uh, because and with two judgments alone. On top of that, we have millions of people. I, in my estimate, I would think that um, we see in Revelation 7 a great multitude which no one can number out of every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation that are in heaven. Apparently, they're martyred. Uh, during this period of time, they come out one by one out of that great tribulation. Millions of people will be martyred for their faith. Millions of people will be martyred for their faith. So along with God's judgment and man's, um, uh, the Antichrist's uh, killing individuals, this will be an unparalleled period of time, especially for Israel. Uh, Jesus was teaching that God in the past had already shortened the great tribulation. He did so in the sense that in the past, he determined to cut it off at a specific time rather than let it continue indefinitely. In his omniscience, God knew that if the great tribulation were to continue indefinitely, all flesh would perish from the earth. To prevent that from happening in the past, God sovereignly set a specific time for the great tribulation to end. And God predicted how long that period of time would be, three and a half years. Now, that last phrase, for he will cut it off for the elect's sake. Now, let's go back to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 4, tells us who the elect are. This is not speaking of individual election, uh, as a Calvinist tried to teach. This is corporate election. God elected a people group. God elected Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he called them the elect. Isaiah 45, verse 4, For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect. Notice, Israel's called my elect, the nation. God corporately chose to regard with favor the nation of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I've even called you by your name. I, I have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no God. There is no God beside me. So Israel is called my elect, my elect. Because God has a future program for Israel and the kingdom, he will not allow these days to run on indefinitely as to eliminate all Jews. Antichrist will try to do that. But keep in mind, God keeps a remnant, even in Petra, for, for a period of three and a half years and preserves a remnant so they'll be left alive to repopulate the millennial kingdom and fulfill the Abrahamic covenant promises, Abrahamic Davidic new covenant promises. Now, he will preserve his, prom his promises with Israel. Notice Jeremiah chapter 33. This is one of the promises of God in the Old Testament in regard to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as a people group. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 35, 33, verse 25, says this. Thus saith the Lord, if my covenant is not with day and night, remember the original creation covenant, 
and, uh, with day and night. And that, then after the flood, by the way, as long as the earth remains, there'll be seed time and harvest, summer and winter. Um, if my covenant is not with the day and night, and if I'm not appointed the ordinance of the heaven and earth, then I will cast away the descendants of Jacob and David my servant, so that I will not take any of his descendants to be rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will cause their captivity to return and will have mercy on them. Israel will continue. Uh, the chosen people of God will continue uh, to exist. Um, it's amazing that uh, we have a state of Israel after 2,000 years. There's no other nation, now keep in mind, there's no other nation that has drifted off the pages of history, so to speak, of prominence, and have come back after 2,000 years with their homeland, as we do with the Jews. That was truly miraculous, what happened in 1948. And God, God did that because he's faithful to his promises. And so it's significant, in order to have a temple, you have to have a land and have to have a people group and that's what we have today. And we have the stage being set for the fulfillment of events that will unfold after the rapture of the church. But God will preserve his remnant, and therefore God cuts off those days. Now let's take a look at a passage in 1 Corinthians 10, 32. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32. <clears throat> And Paul here is talking in the context about, um, you know, certain certain foods that uh, you could eat and not eat. And there were certain things that Jews did not eat and Gentiles could eat. And certain believers believe you could do this and do that. So that's the context. But I want to draw on the principle of three classes of humanity from this passage. Uh, verse 32 says, Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks. Now, the King James has Gentiles, and that's a correct translation. The Jews, Gentiles, or to the Church of God. So, in the broad category, we have three classes of humanity. This is very important. We have Jew, we have Gentile, and we have Church of God. By the way, in uh, Spirit of Zodiates, I looked up that Greek word for Gentile. It, it, it's... Um, Greek, it's a word for, for someone who's Greek, but it's used theologically, as Odiati says, it's used uh, 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 theologically to contrast Gentiles with Jews. So that was an accurate translation in the King James when it said Gentile. That is a correct translation. So there are three classes of humanity, Jew, Gentile, and Church of God. Let's define each one. A Jew is a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A physical, they're born that way, okay? A Gentile is someone who is not a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Church of God consists of saved people from the day of Pentecost till the rapture. We call this the church age. Church did not exist in the Old Testament. Church age saints were not in the Old Testament. We have Jews and Gentiles, but not the church. And therefore, one of the foundational principles of dispensational theology is the distinction between Israel and the church, which flows from literal interpretation, by the way. The foundation for dispensational theology begins with taking the Bible straightforward, literally. And that's being under attack. It's, that doctrine is, is under attack today. God allows figures of speech, but it's still normal, plain sense of words in the scripture. So three classes of humanity, Jew, Gentile, Church of God, and God has a separate prophetic program with each class of humanity. God has a program for the Jew, God has a program for the Gentile, and God has a program for the Church of God. By the way, Dr. Walbert, who I had as a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, he was a second president of Dallas Theological Seminary, he wrote a trilogy of books, Israel and Prophecy, The Church and Prophecy, and The Nations and Prophecy. So he deals with prophecy related to each one of those three categories. 
You also see that in Chafer's systematic theology. You'll see a section in his systematic theology dealing with prophecy in regard to the Jew, prophecy in regard to the Gentile, and prophecy in regard to the Church of God. Let's talk about those uh, three people groups in relationship to the tribulation. Now, to the Jew, God will allow that tribulation for the purpose of breaking Israel's rebellion against God. Israel as a whole have been in rebellion against God. They have not accepted Jesus as their Messiah. The average Jew does not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They're still waiting for the Messiah to come. So God's going to use this great time of pressure and world trouble to cause Israel to look in faith to their true Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's one of the purposes for why a future tribulation. Why does God permit a future tribulation? He's going to accomplish a purpose through this. He's going to finally crush Israel's sinful rebellion. And therefore, preparing it, it, God's elect nation, the nation Israel, for her Messiah, resulting in national regeneration. Daniel 9, 24 through 27, we have a sixfold purpose, and we've gone over this before, but that sixfold purpose, uh, I think I have later on in the chart, I know I'm going to ahead here, but... This chart here shows you, at the end, six reasons in the text in Daniel 9 why a future tribulation period. The 77s, including that last seven years, is for this reason. Mm -hmm. To finish Israel's rebellion. To make an end of sin. And that, in the context, is Israel's sin is ended. Israel will be redeemed. And then Messiah's righteous, bring in everlasting righteousness as Messiah's righteous kingdom will be brought in. To uh, fulfill prophecy, Israel's chastening will be ended. And then the temple will be anointed. So we have to accept Daniel's purpose for why that future period of time. He tells us in the text why future period of time. It's for the Jews. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing to keep in mind is the church age was not, was not foreseen in the Old Testament. It was hidden. It's called a mystery age. The Bible calls it a mystery age. Uh, some call it a parenthesis in God's plan. If you want to look at it that way, I don't have a problem calling it parenthesis. It's not like God, it's an afterthought. When we think of a parenthesis, we think of something that's kind of secondary in nature. The church is not secondary in nature. <laughs> you know, the, the church... Um, it was in God's mind from eternity past. And uh, I don't want to paint it in that light. But as far as prophetically speaking, the church age falls between the 69th, 7th of Daniel, which leads us up to Christ's first coming, him coming as prince, and that future period of time, tribulation leading up to Christ's second coming. We are in that period of time right here, this age, and that was not foreseen at all. This whole prophecy deals with the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jews. Therefore, it's not the purpose of the church to be purified in the tribulation. Arguing for the purpose of Israel, the 77s deal with Israel, not the church. We make that clear distinction. All right, going back to um, the uh, purpose for Israel. So, just briefly summarize, we're going to look at more verses on this, but briefly summarizing God's prophetic purposes with each one of the three people groups. We dealt with the Jew. God will use that time of pressure to cause them to look to their Messiah. Number two, Gentiles. What is God doing with Gentiles in the tribulation? And keep in mind when I say Gentile, I'm talking about unsaved Gentiles in the tribulation because and, and therefore this purpose would be to pour out judgment. So to pour out judgment on unbelieving man and nations, including Antichrist's kingdom. And the ultimate kingdom of rebellion will be a political earthly kingdom headed up by the Antichrist. He will rule over the world at the midpoint of the tribulation. And God's going God's to implement judgment upon that kingdom. And the statue in Daniel, let's turn back to Daniel 2, we see four successive world empires and finally a fifth one in Daniel's image. 
And so this is God's prophetic program for the Gentiles. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel 2. Verse uh, 32, Daniel 2, 32. <clears throat> he explains the imagery here. The image head was of fine gold. So let's just put, uh, I'll put up the image here. Um, and again, I have this in a further uh, chart here, right here. Daniel sees uh, this image. Um, it's dreamed by Nebuchadnezzar. He explains it. He dreamed about the statue's image. It had different metal parts. Uh, Mark Hitchcock has a name for it. He calls it the metallic man. <laughs> various, met, uh, various aspects of metal. And deteriorating quality, by the way, going from gold, you know, <laughs> silver, and so forth. So the image head was a fine golden chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, partly of iron and partly of clay. You watch while a stone was cut without hands which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed together, became like chaff from the summer threshing floor. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. This stone obliter obliterated the image, just ground it to powder and the wind could get the imagery, just blew it away. And uh, the stone that struck the image then became a great mountain. It grew and filled what? What? Filled the whole earth. Not heaven, the earth. Now, when you get to the explanation of it at the end of the chapter, he, uh, he interprets the imagery. Uh, notice here, uh, verse 37, you, king, are king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory, who wherever the children of men dwell and the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven, he hath given them into your hand. He has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. So Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian kingdom, the imagery pictures Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar pictures Babylon as a world empire. You are the head of gold. After that, you shall arise another kingdom, inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. So a fallen kingdom, and we know from history that is the kingdom of the Medes and Persians. We even had that in the book of Daniel, by the way, Daniel 6, the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, prophetically, we, we have in the book of Daniel the kingdom of Greece, and um, that would be the kingdom of bronze mentioned there, third kingdom in verse 39, which will rule over all the, all the earth. Notice these are world Gentile empires. A fourth kingdom we know as the Roman Empire. And Jesus was born under the authority of Rome. They were in charge when Jesus came to this earth. So we have the Ro Roman Empire. The fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron inasmuch as much as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything that iron that crushes a kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with clay. And then finally, we have the toes of the feet. We have, I believe it's depicted, depicting the revival of an empire. It comes from Rome, it comes out of the legs, connected to the legs, but yet a final revival of Rome under a confederation of 10 nations. We call it the revival of an empire. And this will be the um, empire that Antichrist arises out of. Antichrist will come forth from this future revived Roman empire. And he says here, um, whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay, verse 41, is where we're at, Daniel 2. Partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron, partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. You saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. They will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as the iron does not mix with clay. 
And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. We know that that is that stone that fills the whole earth, or the kingdom. Notice the stone cut without hands. This is heavenly in origin. And that's why we have the term kingdom of heaven. It's heavenly in origin, but it, it's on the earth. And this stone smashes this image and ultimately referring to the future millennial kingdom of Christ. So this is God's program for the Gentile, the Gentiles. Partly, you know, there's more passages we could look at uh, about God's prophetic program for the Gentiles. But keep in mind, mm -hmm. Daniel 9, God's future for Israel. Daniel 2, God's future for the Gentiles. And then the third group, the church. But we don't turn to the Old Testament for that. We turn to the New Testament. The church did not begin until Acts chapter 2. So we go back to the purpose of the church, going back here, the purposes of the tribulation. Uh, we will see that God's purpose for the church, I'm sorry I'm jumping around here, but the uh, purpose of the church is to rapture the born-again believer. So uh, God's church will, cons the church will be, consummated or the conclusion of the church age will occur when Jesus returns. When Jesus returns, he will catch up living believers to be with him. He's going to take us back to the Father's house that he has prepared. The dead in Christ will rise first. So we have this church age in between. So God has a unique program for the church. So all three distinct purposes for the Jew, the Gentile, in the church of God. Now, let's deal with the tribulation period in regard. So let's take a look at God's purposes for the Jew in relationship to that tribulation period. Let's begin Daniel 12, 1. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And here uh, we have that same unparalleled period of time mentioned as in the words of Jesus in Matthew 24. At that time, Michael shall stand up the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Notice that. Now, what's interesting, he's, he describes that same period of time, that unparalleled point period of time as a great tribulation, but we have a deliverance of Daniel's people. We don't have... God through with the Jews at this point. See, Praetorism would say that, well, the tribulation period occurred in AD 70, and that was God's judgment on Israel for rejecting the Messiah, and God's done with them, and he's replaced Israel with the church, and they call us spiritual Israel. That term, that, there's nowhere in the Bible that says the church is spiritual Israel. We're not called spirit, we're not uh, Israel. But here, this passage indicates God's going to use that period of time to deliver his people. Not to uh, annihilate his people, but to deliver them. To deliver them. And then he explains that. He explains that further down in chapter 12, verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this river bank, and the other on that river bank. And the, there's a man clothed in linen who is above the waters of the river, probably an angel here, Daniel sees. And the question is, how long shall be the fulfillment of these wonders? You know, how long will this period of time last? And then he said, I heard the man in the linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand, his left hand to heaven, swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times and half a time. Now, how long is that? The time is one. Simple math. This is addition. Times plus two. Half a time is a half. So that's three and a half years. That's three and a half years. And during that three and a half years, God will do what? Here it is. Look at the last part of verse 7, Daniel 12. When the power of the holy people, Daniel's people, the Jews, has been completely shattered, meaning their stubborn rebellion has been broken, all these things shall be complete or finished. So this is the part of the definition of Israel in relationship to the tribulation. 
he will break Israel's stubborn rebellion. That's clear in that passage in Daniel chapter 12. He will break Israel's stubborn rebellion. He'll use that unparalleled period of time to do that. All right. Okay, let's take a look at um, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. And Jeremiah, as we saw last week, calls this period of time the time of Jacob's trouble. Alas, for that day is great, so that it's none like it. And I said before, there's only one unparalleled time in world history. There can't be two. Otherwise, it'd be unparalleled, right? <laughs> it's the very nature of something being unparalleled. <laughs> it doesn't occur again. It's unprecedented. Uh, this period of time is the same period of time that Daniel describes in Daniel 12 and Jesus describes in Matthew 24. Same period of time. Um, and this is a time of Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. Now, will God, during that period of time, annihilate the Jew? Will he annihilate his chosen people? No. He will save them once again. Look, says, he shall be saved out of it. He's going to be delivered. There's going to be a remnant that will rise out of that three and a half year period. And notice verse nine, and this is the kingdom. He's going to take them out of that tribulation period, the believing remnant who places their faith in Jesus as Messiah. And then verse nine says, they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Notice that. So the Davidic covenant promises will be fulfilled. And they're going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in the coming kingdom. So this language is clear. As they go through that unprecedented period of trouble, God uses that to bring out a remnant who will place their faith in the Messiah. Uh, chapter 20, uh, 30, verse 22. 30, verse 22, further down. He says, you shall be my people and I will be your God. Notice that people whom Jeremiah is writing. He's not writing to the church. Um, you're going to be my people. We're going to have a restored relationship once this occurs. And notice here, the fierce anger of the Lord will not return until he has done it. Verse 24. Until he has performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will consider it. Notice, this is in the latter days. It wasn't fulfilled in Jeremiah's time. This is prophetic. It's future. Now, we won't read the passage in Deuteronomy 4.30, but that is the first mention of an unparalleled period of time, or a period of trouble, at least, using that word, uh, tribulation, uh, for the nation of Israel. Micah chapter 3. Let's look at Micah. Micah. Chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. Okay, I think I have, uh, maybe that's Malachi. Let's try it. I think that's Malachi. Yeah, that's uh, Malachi. Malachi, Micah. Let's try Malachi. Yeah, Malachi chapter th 3, verse 2 and 3. But who can endure the day of his coming? This is Christ's second coming. Who can stand when he appears? He is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. What do you do with silver to remove the impurities? You heat it and then skim off the impurities. All that, all that heat has a goal and purpose to remove the impurities from the silver. So God's going to use this time of pressure, tribulation, to remove Israel's impurities. Um, he's going to refine them like a refiner's fire, uh, a refiner who smelts metal, and like a launder soap, cleansing them. Um, he will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering of righteousness. So he's going to use that period of time to purify the Jews. And then uh, verse 6 and 7, he does this because he does not change. God's promises continue because his nature is unchangeable. 
For I, the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed with sons of Jacob. Think about that. I haven't, forgotten my I haven't forgotten my promises, God says, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That land belongs to them. And in spite of the rebellion, I'll discipline them. I'm going to bring them through a period of trouble. But I'm going to remember my promises to them because my nature does not change. There is a, you can put a stake in that as far as this is, mark that, this is God's promises based on his character and essence to Israel. It's wonderful. Uh, Zechariah chapter uh, 8, excuse me, Zechariah 13, 8 and 9. Zechariah 13, 8 and 9. Let's go back to verse 7. This is interesting prophetically because we have two comings of Christ in, in this passage. We have the first coming of Christ where the shepherd was smitten. Look at this, look at this verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion. Said the Lord, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Christ was stricken. Remember his disciples scattered. He was Israel's shepherd. He was rejected in his first coming. So God's going to use a period of time of the, called the tribulation to bring Israel back to their Messiah. It shall come to pass in that land, said the Lord, that two thirds in it shall be cut off and die. But one third shall be left in it. During that tribulation period, two-thirds of the Jews will be annihilated. Two-thirds of the Jews will be annihilated during the tribulation. He's going to bring one-third of it through it, a remnant, uh, a believing remnant. And then he will refine them as silver is refined. Same language we saw in the other minor prophet. He's going to refine them uh, as silver is refined. And test them as gold is tested. Again, using the heat of the tribulation, to remove Israel's rebellion and purities. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. They will, again, look in faith to their Messiah by the end of that period of time. Israel's rebellion against God will be ended. The nation will turn to their Messiah. And that's the purpose of this time. And that's why, going back to our passage of Matthew 23, 39, God's going to cut it short for his elect sake, Israel. See? Because he has promises that he will fulfill with them, including a national regeneration. And notice in Romans chapter 11, Romans 11, it, does God promise a future for Israel in the New Testament? Obviously, yes. Some people say, well, that's just the Old Testament, you know, and those promises were conditional, and Israel failed, and therefore God's done with them. And uh, no, no. Well, Paul argues in Romans 11, there's a future for Israel. In Romans 11, verse 25 to 27, For I do not desire, brethren, you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. This is not your opinion, but what God's word says. That blindness in part has happened to Israel. Right now there's a judgment of blindness, spiritual blindness upon the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as a whole. It's partial, it's not total. Until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in, meaning God's dealing now with the Gentiles, by and large. And then all Israel will be saved. Notice, and so all Israel will be saved, meaning national salvation. The deliverer will come out of Zion, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Zion is Jerusalem. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Notice the new covenant promises. Israel will be regenerated. This is a covenant with them, quoting Jeremiah, uh, when I take away their sins. When I take away their sins. So there is a spiritual restoration of the Jews in the future by the end of the tribulation. And then there is a national restoration back to their land. And uh, God's going to fulfill that. He'll use that tribulation for that very purpose. All right. God's purpose for Israel in the tribulation is to bring about the conversion of a multitude of Jews who will enter into the blessings of the kingdom and experience the fulfillment of all of Israel's covenants. Again, uh, going back to Malachi. Malachi the last book of the Old Testament, um, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, Malachi 4, by, verses 5 and 6. 
Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before that great and coming, great, great and dreadful day of the Lord. Another mention of that period of time, especially at the end of that period of time. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, hearts of the children to the father, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So God will fulfill all of Israel's covenants with them. This 77 will run its course and the sixfold purpose of that period of time will be accomplished. Israel's rebellion will be ended. Now, second reason why a future tribulation. Uh, God's going to pour out judgment on unbelieving men and nations. Now, if you argue that, well, have we seen this in the past? The answer would be yes. It's called the global flood. If you take the book of Genesis literally, mankind became so wicked that God had to judge the whole human race, except for one family of eight. And uh, Jesus made this comparison between the times of Noah's flood and the coming of the Son of Man. Let's take a look at Matthew 24. Uh, Matthew 24, verses 37 through 39. But as of the days of Noah were, as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. That's the second coming. It's not the rapture coming of the Son of Man, to establish his kingdom. As in the days before the flood, what were they doing before God sent universal rain and flood from the earth below, from the waters below and from the waters above? As the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving a marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And notice they were, there's two ways to look at this, verse 38. There's one way to say that, well, they were going about normal activities without any consideration of God's justice. Sometimes, so you can also say they were in enhanced rebellion, certainly against God during that time. We had the Nephilim invasion, certainly before the flood. We have a distortion of what biblical marriage was, perversion before the flood. Um, you have uh, certain sin trends in, in violence in the land as we study the book of Genesis, murder, and uh, so these individuals were disregarding uh, God's warning. Remember, there was he warned, Noah warned for 120 years about a coming judgment. And they mocked and they didn't listen until one day God finally sent it. So be similar in nature. We'll have a world in rebellion against God right before the second coming. And therefore... That's why that period of time likened before the days of the coming of the Son of Man is to be like the days before the flood. So there'll be a judgment upon mankind. And God will do it not through rain or water like he did in Noah's day. He'll do it through sealed trumpet and bowl judgments from the sky and from below too. God will use nature to judge man. I think why does he do that? Because man has turned back to worshiping nature. And that's why he uses nature as a judgment. Let's worship the sun, okay? Let's worship the sun. I'm going to send intense heat. And uh, let's worship the waters. Let's worship the waters. I'm going to pollute the waters. Uh, let's worship the tree. I'm going to burn the trees. Um, man, I think the hint at when we study the book of Revelation is man goes back to worshiping the creation, like Romans 1, instead of the creator God. And therefore, God, like in the days of Egypt, the, the plagues in Egypt, there are a lot of parallels. We, when we study those judgments, uh, there are parallels to the Egyptian flood, darkness. Remember that? Hail. We have some of the same judgments in Egypt as we see in the future tribulation because they had gods associated with each one of those things, Egypt. So it was a, it was a polemic against Egyptian gods, the judgments that were sent in Egypt. Same with the tribulation period. God's gone to judge the objects of men's worship. The objects of men's worship. And um, Isaiah 26, 21. Let's take a look at that. Isaiah 26. Several passages on this time of unparalleled judgment upon the ungodly. Isaiah 26, verse 21. 
For behold, the Lord comes out of his place. Now, let's go back one verse. I, <laughs> I keep seeing the, 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 looking at the verses in, in front of it, and I say, well, I can't ignore that one either. Look at verse 21. Come, my people, enter to your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a moment. Who's my people? The Jews. Hide during this period. Hide yourself for a moment until the indignation is past. That's another term for the tribulation. And part of the Jews will hide themselves in Petra. But he says, The Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also will disclose our blood and will no more cover us slain. So the Lord will punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. Isaiah 34, verse 2. Isaiah 34, verse 2. For the indignation of the Lord is against all nations. Notice that. The indignation of the Lord is against all nations. Then the New Testament tells us the same thing. Uh, the purpose of, one of the purposes of that future time. Revelation 3.10. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. And this is a verse we examined before. We'll look at it again. Um, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial. Another period, another term describing this period of trouble. This tribulation period. I will keep you from that future hour of trial, the time of that trial, which shall come upon all the world, Notice it's worldwide in nature. What, por what point? What's the purpose? It tells us. To test who? Those who dwell on the earth. And that's a term for unbelievers. Katakeo, those who dwell down on the earth. It's used in the book of Revelation for the unbeliever. Is it there? Is the purpose there to test the church? Believers? No. It's to test the unbeliever. It's judgment on them. God doesn't have to purify his bride. Imagine, we're the bride of Christ. If you're a believer, you're part of Christ's bride. And God's going to beat up his bride during the tribulation. God's not going to allow that. God's going to rescue his bride before that period of time begins. He's going to come back for his bride in John 14. Uh, we have that wedding analogy, by the way, a bridegroom analogy. The groom goes away, prepares a house for the bride, and then comes back and takes the bride to the house he prepared. And then we had the wedding, which will occur in heaven. So he's going to rescue his bride. He's not going to allow his bride to go through that period of unparalleled trouble. Um, now let's take a look at uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 17. And we can study the word wrath. It's an interesting word study from Revelation 6 to 19 when we seek about wrath. How many times it's used in that passage during that tribulation period, God's wrath. Uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 17. For the great day of his wrath has already occurred. We have, a, we have here past tense action from the Greek, Greek uh, verbs there. Greek verb there has already occurred, we could say, and who is able to stand. So the sealed judgments include God's wrath. Great day of his, of his wrath has already occurred. Revelation 14, verse 10. And again, this is not exhaustive as far as, you know, um, terminology and revelation about God's judgment. Um, it's all the way through there. He talks about um, the beast worshipers in verse 9. If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead and on, on his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out full strength. He's not going to hold back. Full measure into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, the presence of his holy angels, and the presence of the Lamb. So not only will you judge while well, physically alive, but eventually eternal judgment in the lake of fire for the beast worshipers. Uh, look at verse 15 of that same chapter. Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who said, who said on the, the, the cloud, Thrust in the sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. 
you heard the expression grapes of wrath. This is God reaping a harvest of judgment uh, by judging these rebels. Thrust in the sharp, sharp sickle, verse 18, in the middle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for the grapes are fully ripe, meaning they're ready to be harvested. God does not allow, God allows sin and iniquity to continue until it's full-blown worldwide rebellion. So we look at our time, we say, where are you, God? Why haven't you, why have, why haven't you judged you know, those in leadership, maybe, corrupt, corrupt politicians or individuals. God's reserving his fullest wrath for that future period of time. Think about that. He's allowing it to build. We had the same principle in the Old Testament. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So God allows rebellion to build, to build, to build, to build. And then he's going to pour out his wrath upon an unbelieving world. And that will not occur until he removes his bride first. He's gonna take you out first. So that should, that should encourage you when you think about the evil around us, it's building, it's growing. Break down in marriage, break down even an understanding of the distinction between a man and a woman. You would think that would be basic. You can't even make, you can't, you can't distinguish between a man and a woman. There's a problem there. There's a real problem, but no, we want to mix the genders because we really don't agree with the way you created man and women. See, it's a rebellion against God is what it is. Romans 1 is the creation saying to the creator, why did you make me this way? That's what you're doing. If you're not satisfied with the gender you're born with, you're saying to God, why did you make me this way? You need to accept the way God made you he made you in his image, whether male or female. You're both in the image of God, and you're special in God's eyes. And you need to accept the way you're made. And don't rebel against God. Maybe if I change my gender, maybe I do this thing. It's not going to bring you peace and happiness in your life. It'll only bring hurt and turmoil. You're rebelling against God. So accept the way God made you. I made in God's image, and therefore... I'm going to glorify God in my body and the spirit, which are God's. But we have this, I think, in the tribulation. We have, you know, an outward rebellion in all forms, sexual immorality, idolatry. I think even gender confusion continues on into the tribulation. The breakdown of marriage, the breakdown of marriage, which includes, you know, the basic, the ability to reproduce, male and female, um, so that's all part of that equation uh, in Satan's agenda that will come to fruition during that period of time. But God is just in what he does here. God is perfectly just. So, you know, the thing is, wait a little longer. When you see the evil around you, it's like, we want God to do something right away. He is aware. <laughs> and his plan is going forward. Our point being part of the bride, the church, is to let our light shine before men, to be a witness, and to continue to do what God has called us to do in the church, to glorify him. And that time, when that time comes, he will rapture us out before that period begins. Now, one more passage to look at is Revelation 16, in this section here, Revelation 16. And the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, Revelation 16:10. His kingdom became full of darkness. They gnawed their tongues before because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of the pains in their sores and did not repent of their deeds. You see, you think, well, all this judgment, people will bow their knee to God. They will not. They'll further entrench themselves in their hatred of God and their rebellion against God. Um, so they are deserving of judgment. The tribulation tests the heart. Remember Revelation 3.10? It tests the nature of man's rebellion. And it shows that even when God judges, man is still defiant. Defiant to the end. And therefore, God is just in his judgments. And that's why when he returns with, on a white horse with the sword proceeding out of his mouth, the idea of the spoken word of God, when he judges the armies of the Antichrist, he comes as a just judge a just and fair judge, judging the unsaved 
world. So we have this period of time then called the times of the Gentiles. Gentiles will be in control of Jerusalem until the fullness of the Gentiles will come in. And that will not occur until the second coming. Antichrist will be over the temple area in the midpoint at the midpoint of tribulation. So the times of the Gentiles will continue to run their course uh, in, even after the rapture, that time period of the Gentiles, until that stone cut without hands will defeat the Antichrist's kingdom and Christ's kingdom will be established. God will use that future period of time called Daniel 70 at 7 to purify Israel so that Israel will come to faith in their Messiah. And then before that period of time, the Lord will rapture the church out of this period, out of this world, and then God will pour out his wrath upon the unbelieving world. Let's take a look at a couple more passages. We want to close out with the promises to the church. So uh, let's take a look at, and I have it later in my notes. Let's take a look at um, 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. And let's take a look at verse 9. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. And then we'll look at 2 Peter 2, 9. So that's 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath. Us, church age believer. God did not appoint us. And the wrath in the context is not the wrath of hell, but the wrath of the day of the Lord. God did not appoint us to that wrath of the day of the Lord. But to obtain salvation, that's stage three. That's our glorification. When he comes for the church, he will glorify our bodies. Uh, to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, that, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are doing. And then 2 Peter 2.9. He speaks of the example of Sodom and Gomorrah and back in the book of Genesis, and he says the application here. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of testing. And he removed Sodom from Gomorrah, or Lot from Gomorrah, before he judged the cities of the plain. Physically separated from. Out of means, ek, Greek preposition, separation from. And to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Sodom and Gomorrah was judged. We have a worldwide judgment in the tribulation uh, that will be unparalleled. But first of all, God will take us out. He will exit the bride before that day of the Lord begins, that time of tribulation. So God is a program for the Jew, a program for the Gentile, and a program, prophetically speaking, for the church of God. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your prophetic program and the comfort that we have being part of the bride as born again believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who will rescue, rescue us from that coming time of wrath that even though as we see the earth in our culture right now our, our country progressively shaking their fist and rebelling against you we know that they are right for judgment and that's coming first though you will remove us from this period of time and rescue us, and then they will receive the proper judgment that is deserving of them. But you know, we know your heartbeat and your care for lost mankind. You're not willing that any should perish. We thank you for that. You want all individuals to have a change of mind and place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, that we might be we might share that good news of faith alone and Christ alone, that gospel message to an unbelieving world, so that they will be taken out before this period of time begins. And we ask these things in Christ's name.